Good morning. Three days ago, we talked about Jesus. And who is Jesus exactly? A lot of us know him as our Savior and our Messiah and um, Son of God and so much more. And we even talked about that in the last video, how he seems to be so much more. Well, I've been reading through the Bible and so far I'm in Psalms and in uh, Romans. And I love it because I'm learning so much, like these little nuggets that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. But today I just opened up my Bible app and I saw that it was talking in um, Isaiah 44, I think. Was it Isaiah? Oh no, it was Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And I'll read it real quick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I'm reading this and it hit me. This is God talking through Isaiah. And it just made me think about that video again. And I got curious and I'm pretty sure it was the Holy Spirit's nudging because I was like, I'm going to go check that chapter out. And I backed up and I read the whole chapter and I was like, wow. All right, God, you're stretching my brain again. God is God and there is no other but him, which then makes you reconsider who is Jesus. And honestly, my gut says when the scripture calls him Emmanuel, God with us, and when he is called the Lord, I know he's my God in flesh. And a lot of you agree with me. And then obviously some people, they don't think that's true at all. And they, in fact, they think it's kind of blasphemous because there's only one God. And I would argue you are absolutely right. There is only one God, but our God isn't, he's not someone we can put in a box. So you even go back to Genesis, let us make man in our image. He seems to be plural within himself, which I don't even like saying because man, the stuff going on in our world right now, they would jump on that, not realizing it's nothing that they're trying to relate to. Our God is holy. But I want to read Isaiah 43, and I'm going to bounce around because I want to hit some key parts that really just blew my mind that God is God, no one else. So when you take Jesus into account, he has to be God in flesh, especially for God to exalt him and lift him up rather than bring him down because no one's allowed to claim to be God. I mean, let's read Isaiah 43 together and you tell me what you think. So we'll start uh, right at verse one. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. And I want to stop there real quick, because two things jumped out at me, and I punch them out for you, um, for I have redeemed you. And then later on, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. He's already, he's already identifying as our Redeemer, our Savior. And of course that makes sense. He did redeem them from Egypt, right? And, and, and there's so many other times he has proven himself to be a God of redemption, a God of forgiveness. It didn't begin with Jesus. And I'm saying this more like to people like me who want to categorize them, even though we know they're one. Jesus is a reflection of God. But sometimes it's so easy to be like, God is the God of the Old Testament and Jesus is of the new. They are the same. They are the same. Jesus is reflecting the God who always was and the God who is. Jesus isn't giving us some new example, some new insight. He 
is their redeemer. He is the savior. God made a way. Sometimes we forget in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God created the solution. Even though it caused great sacrifice on his own part, God is the savior. God is the redeemer. He poured himself out into flesh, God with us, so that he could redeem us, so he could be our savior. And it just blows my mind because at the same time, they're distinct. They're distinct. But it's so rich. He is the only God. So let's keep reading because he makes that very clear. So let's keep going. And I'm going to skip down to uh, verse 10, okay? You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Ooh, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? Whew. Thus says the Lord, your redeemer. You guys, it's, it's, it's like he's laying it out. Jesus? is him, he is Jesus, and they're distinct. They, he, because he's God and he can do what he wants, he is huge. It, it blows my mind. And yet when I read this, it's so simple. It's a simple yet mind-blowing reality that there is no other God. He alone is God. And he alone is claiming to be the redeemer and savior. And yet he is also the one in Philippians Two, what is it, nine through 11, that lifts Jesus up to the highest place, to the highest name, to his own glory. And it's, you realize this is a facet of him. Jesus is a facet of him. This isn't, a, it's like, it's a separate entity, but it, it is also a facet of our God. I hope I'm making sense. It's just amazing. All right, and I'm gonna skip to verse 18 again. I read it in the beginning. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. And, and in this context, I just think, I've got to stop thinking of God how I used to think of him. Do not remember the former things. And, and I know in, in a way he's, he's talking about our past, right? And, but at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I have got to allow God to blow my mind. I have to allow him to spill out and make a mess because my finite brain wants to make him small and not because I want to dishonor him, but just to make him make sense. But I have to allow my mind to be blown. I have to allow that God and Jesus are one and they're distinct, that God is God, that God is the savior and God is also the Holy Spirit. We haven't even touched on that yet. <laughs> Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I just, oh, how beautiful. How beautiful is that? Behold, I will do a new thing. A road in the wilderness, a river in the desert. And it just, that image of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. There was no way to God. There wasn't one. We were broken and sinful, and he made a way. He made a way. He's the redeemer. He's the savior. And I'm going to go down because um, there's this portion in the lower part of chapter 43 where um, it's even called pleading with unfaithful Israel. It's the answer to why he has to make a new way. Why did God have to do what he did? Why? So starting at verse 22. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob. 
and you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me in the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have brought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. So here's a God who sees almost the impossible. They're not, they're unfaithful. Their sins are stacking up. Here's his answer, verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. And it just makes you bounce back to prior. He, he provides the answer in the beginning of 43. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to be your savior. No one else is going to do it. It's going to be me because there's no other God but me. He's making it very clear that the one who comes and does this, this thing of new, not of old, it's going to be me. I will blot out your sin. I will remember your sins no more. Holy smokes. And now I know some of you have already got this down. Um, but this was huge for me. Because in my mind, even though I know God and Jesus are both one and distinct, it's hard to make peace with that. But I read through this and I just got to thank God because he led me to it. He got, he got me curious. He made me back up and read the whole chapter. And I was just like, oh boy, you are answering this question. Like when people think we're blaspheming God by saying Jesus is God, I understand their angst. I understand why that upsets them because there is no other God. Jesus is God. He's distinct. Right? Once he did that miracle, once he put himself in the womb, a distinction was made. But the source was God. God came. God with us. And um, so I'm going to skip to chapter 44 because let's, let's bring this home a little more. Chapter 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from the time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. You guys, he, he said it from the beginning. He said it, he said it way back in Isaiah. I'm coming to redeem you. I'm making a new way. Forget the things of old. You guys can't even, you can't even carry them out. You, you're unfaithful. You're not bringing your sacrifices. And honestly, guys, we all know David knew those sacrifices weren't what he really wanted anyway. He wanted this sacrificed. He wanted us, the old ways. He promised back with Isaiah, and even before that, guys, he's been promising for a long time, I'm going to make a new way. I'm going to make a new way. You're going to call him Emmanuel, God with us. And again, Philippians 2, who in, uh, well, okay, let me go to it because I don't want to mess this up. Philippians 2 is huge to me. It just kind of lays it out in a beautiful way. Kind of like what Isaiah is doing, that he is God. He is God. And he is the Redeemer. And he is the Savior. No one else. No one else. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, I think I've found it. Verse 5. In Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no other God. I am coming to make a new way. I am your redeemer. I am your savior. And even again in verse 44, there is no other rock besides me. I am it. And here comes Jesus, equal to God, but lowering himself. God with us, lowering himself. And then who exalts him in order for his own glory? God. God is uplifting him. Is almost like the answer to everyone's question. This distinction here, the Savior Redeemer, is me. I hope I made sense. <laughs> this is huge. I love it. And I'm really enjoying just diving in. I was going to talk about Romans today because Romans is awesome, heavy. If you want to get to the meat of your salvation and what it means, Romans especially starting about Romans 5 is when it really started to like, oh, wow. Guys, read your, read your Bibles because I'm learning so much just by making myself not only read through it, but explore. I call it like explorative reading where there's the plan to read through it, but then there's also that I need to learn something and I look things up and I, and I dig around. And I just feel like when you have both of those, you have that foundational reading that's getting you through, but then you also have that explorative stuff where I feel like you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you something that might be outside the box, outside the reading plan. And that's what happened for me today. I stumbled across Isaiah and it just completed what was it, Thursday's video for me? It completed it. Because it's like on one side, we're looking at Jesus. And on this side, we're looking at God. And no matter what side you come from, they're one. They're distinct, but they're one. And it's beautiful. Feel free to share more. I bet there is so many more scriptures where God says, I am he and I am coming to make something new. So you guys have a good day.